Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, good, you're okay. on. So, okay. yeah, but we want you to be in the picture too. So, well, yes, George please. Has... Jordan okay. James. Hi, girl. Hi, girl. Oh, yeah. you. Oh, my God. <laughs> you feel right next All to right. me. We should put that back a little. Like, is that possible? Yes. Hey. Is that okay? How are you doing, Gil? That's perfect. You... That's great. Hey, I don't know what you... how you doing, there right? There. All right. <laughs> oh, great. Hey, Gil. <laughs> and there's, there's and Gil. George. Yeah. Same. What a reunion. Is Ray there? <laughs> yeah. Ray's there. Ray is there. there. Yes. There's yeah. Ray. Okay, Ray. Okay, Ray. There's oh, Ning. God. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final episode of Feedback for the Season. With us here today are composer George Crum, pianist Gil Kalish and James Freeman, and percussionist Ray DeRoche. Thank you all so much for being here today to talk with us about music for a summer evening. Uh, it's a huge honor being with you here today. This episode is a bit different than the ones preceding it in that we're not talking a piece that talking about a piece that was written for Yarnwire as a group. Instead, this work was written in 1974, and it's largely responsible for, in fact, our entire existence. <laughs> it's a, it, it's a responsible for our instrumentation, and really it's the reason we are doing what we do now. There's of course another connection, and that being Stony Brook University. This is where all of the members of Yarnwire met as students, where Gil teaches now, and where Ray was teaching for my first year as a graduate student as well. We thought it would be really interesting to talk to you all about the origins of the piece, how you all put it together, and whatever else comes up. Before we get started, I wanted to thank Steve Bruns at the University of Colorado Boulder for helping us out with all the scheduling, logistics, all the emails and calls, and also just for his general sense of excitement for today's talk. It's been really encouraging and amazing. Um, so just to get things rolling, um, we know that this piece was a Fromm Foundation commission and finished in 1974, but we're all really curious, uh, how did this project come about in general? I mean, whose idea was it for the four of you to come together um, and, and make this piece? Well, I can talk a little bit about that. It was, um, it was commissioned by Paul Fromm, but it was set in motion by, by Peter Graham Swing, who was the chairman of Swarthmore's music department at that mm. time. And, and my understanding, I don't know whether this is so, George, you can speak to this, but I had heard that Peter was hoping that it would be a chorus, choral piece because he was a chorus conductor uh, mm -hmm. and so naturally wanted that. And he went to George uh, and he told me, George said, no, uh, I have this piece ready and that's what it's going to be. So that's what it was. Uh, but that's my understanding of how it got actually started. I don't know how you, well, you came up with the instrumentation for the bar talk, I, I, I guess. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that probably was an influence right there. But the piece goes back, so I had to pull my score out of kind of has my memory a little what was all involved in the piece. So I have the score now, it's coming back to me. But uh, the uh, interesting thing, it was commissioned, uh, by, as he says, by, by Swarthmore College. I was unable to make this premiere performance because I had earlier uh, got myself into going to Canada. I was supposed to go there too. So I missed the first performance altogether. I only heard you guys later, you know, from the recording and then maybe you played it again at some point. So uh, that's sort of how it got started. But the uh, 
piece goes back in years, but uh, I recognize my own style, I guess, when I look at the score. <laughs> and so did you did you all get to work together on on rehearsals or or were you guys just familiar with uh, George's music already? And how, how did that come together? I, you were. I, can, I can speak to that, but probably Ray can can speak to that. Um, oh, no. Ray's not going to speak too much. Ray forgets too, George. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, oh, does he ever. <laughs> you got a lot of uh, senior people around here, I think. Somehow or other. <laughs> a polite way of saying it, right? That's true. <laughs> um, you were at most of the rehearsals because most of the rehearsals were at Ray's place where he taught then uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, right? Which was, I can't remember, was it Mil William Mil Bandler. Yeah, um, and because you had the percussion up there um, and nobody else had the percussion. So that was the ideal place to rehearse. And, and I drove you up, um, oh, okay. I drove you up and I always remember famous story in my mind was it was in during the, you know, late or late winter um, of 74, I guess, or 75, maybe, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, in any case, I remember what, I think it was the last rehearsal we had. And it was um, late at night when we headed back to mm -hmm. media and Swarthmore. And I was, looked like I was running out of gas in my van. And we stopped at a gas station on the Jersey Pike. Uh, and the guy said, I'm sorry, I can't give you any gas today. You have the wrong license plate number because that was in the middle of the gas crisis. You young people don't remember that, but at that time you, you had to get, uh, you, you, your license plate had to be an even number or an odd number depending upon the day. And he said, he said no, I, you'll have to wait until tomorrow. Well, it was 1 a.m. at that point. <laughs> I said, this is crazy, we can't do that. And I was really mad at the guy, but George patted me on the shoulder and said, Jim, just, I've heard if you drive at 50 miles an hour, uh, you save gas. So let's just do that and maybe we'll make it home. So we did that and we did make it home. <laughs> right, it comes back to me. Yeah. I never heard that story. <laughs> never heard that story? No. And of course we had to, uh, Jim and George had to come up from Pennsylvania and I came from the city along with Dick Fitz. And we had, I mean, Ray had a place where there were two pianos and percussion equipment. And we always rehearsed there. Mm. And it was, it was a hassle, no question. <laughs> the, uh, the pianos were probably not the right size. I mean, to get two concert grand pianos. And you know the way George writes, he doesn't seem to care about the inside of the piano, whether, <laughs> whether it's an M or an L or a, or a D. Uh, so, you know, crossbars yeah. don't mean anything to him and uh, yeah. things like that. Uh, and so, you know, to, in a certain way, it's like, um, it's like people said that such and such a piece, Tchaikovsky Concerto, Sibelius Concerto, couldn't be played. It was beyond people to play it. Well, now everybody on the street comes in and plays those pieces, Rachmaninoff third in every competition, you have five people playing it. And that's, these are pieces that were never supposed to be able to be played. Well, in a certain way, this was like that. George was writing, he was inventing an instrument. That instrument really didn't exist, even though you know Henry Cowell had done this and that, but as a legitimate, new instrument this was an invention of george's and um it was hard you know bending over the piano putting the music finding a place to put the music uh how do you how do you identify the keys uh all of that where are the harmonics what do you do you do chalk or do you put tape on the on the keys it was like uh, an invention and it was really hard uh, and we, we worked very, you know, we had a lot of rehearsal, if I remember correctly. You <laughs> well, and George, well, was George at the rehearsals? Pardon? George was at all the, all the rehearsals, well, I think. Was it all I, the think rehearsals? So. Yeah. I think so. I think so. 
but I remember that you weren't at the, at the first performance of Swarthmore, and, and yes, you're right, Gil, it was a very, very hard piece. I mean, I, when I see people playing this piece today, I think, looks so easy. How, how do they do that uh, when we struggled? But as you say, it was very new, and, 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 uh, and uh, um, I remember the first performance being B minus, maybe at best. It was not a masterly performance, as I remember. I uh, beg I your we pardon. I'm glad that you weren't there. But we got better at it. <laughs> we did it later, much better at Chicago and, in, at, and at the Library of Congress, I remember. Well, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, Gil. <laughs> well, I mean, he had to learn the African thumb piano, like, you know, George just wrote for that. Learn it, whatever, yeah. you know. I, sure it's again a composer writes something, learn it, learn how to play the the recorder. You know. Do, yeah. do you all remember the parts that you played? I guess I guess you do. You um, if uh, if you're kind of mentioning the thumb piano part, Ray. Do you remember what which percussion? Well, the slide whistle was a tough one for me. <laughs> Trust me, <laughs> that was a tough one, and the whistling. The whistling. There were times in the performance where I couldn't get a whistle out, and all of a sudden I hear it coming out, and Gil was whistling. <laughs> I've seen him several times. Trust me, he did. Yeah, the <laughs> singing and whistling. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, Gil would just take up the whistle, he would whistle. You know, it was hard for me to do that stuff. Gil, mm -hmm. I know you're you are really good at whistle and uh, whistling. and uh... Sometimes, only sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, remember I wasn't good at whistling. <laughs> It was a tough thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I remember asking you, Gil, um, at Stony Brook, I said, I cannot whistle. What should I do about George's piece? And you said, get someone to whistle for you and sit in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or you said, second choice is don't play that piece. <laughs>slide whistle is in the first recording the recording of it you know someone said it was it was wet it wasn't working well at all i mean the instrument was just not mm. it was faulty and so i they said put on a radiator i put on a radiator where i <laughs> didn't realize it but it just stopped i couldn't use it anymore so we had to re you remember we had to go back for another session to record that movement mm. With the slide whistle? You remember that, guys? I don't remember that. I don't remember it either. Oh, yeah, that happened. Slide whistle, I couldn't play it. It was just stuck. Yeah. Period. I mean, that's really hard to do for those guys to, and to sing in tune. Oh, yeah. yes. Very hard for me. I mean, really, this is, you know, above and beyond, but 
That's what George's hard. music I, is. I do remember that, it, that the church where we recorded it, 73rd and Broadway, um, we had to use, isn't this right, Gil? We had to use, um, 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 they, they didn't have Steinways because Steinways wouldn't let us use the insides of the pian pianos. So uh, wh uh, what were the other, other pianos of the time? Well, it was Baldwin. It was Baldwin's, it was Baldwin's, which, well, which worked, but the bars weren't in the same place. No. Oh, yeah, right. Well, we had, I, I think we had, George took out the bar. He really? unscrewed the bar. Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it won't hurt the piano. I, I mean, it. I have another it's story so about it. it. I mean, in those days, it was really, uh, you got a, uh, a lot of, you know, kickback. Yeah. If you tried to do things inside the piano. There was a terrible story uh, of mine when uh, Jan, the guy Tani and I uh, played in Carnegie Hall. It was a big deal for Jan, the big, the big hall. And we made a, a, something special beyond that out of it by asking a few dear composer friends to write pieces for us. And among them was uh, this Edgar Allen piece called Sleeper that George wrote. And so the day of the performance, we were in Carnegie Hall and it's a, it's a very gentle piece actually, Sleeper. It's very quiet and it all involves strumming and uh, muting and pits. And so we were rehearsing it and they, they came storming out the Carnegie Hall people, what are you doing? And uh, we said, well, this is, we're just rehearsing for tonight. Well, you can't do that to our pianos. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, if we can't do that, we can't play the concert. And it was a big to do. And they really? called Steinway, which was across the street. And they said, no, he cannot do that. Uh, that's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. And so what they did, they had four pianos and they gave us the worst piano that they never used for anything because it was not something that they were proud to use. That's how I've had to play the concert. Hmm. And it was very emotionally hmm. upsetting to Jan. I remember that. You may imagine the day of a concert, first time she's doing a recital at Carnegie Hall and you have to have all of this commotion hmm. going on and this kind of negative reaction. Well, it's different now with pianos. I think they're much more, no, still. Somewhat, yeah, this rings very some, familiar. Yeah, had some, some intense experiences as well. Yeah, yeah, we've all had that experience, I think. Um, in 1997, I remember with, with 2000, Orchestra 2001, I, I, we did this piece um, in Glinka Hall in St. Petersburg in Russia. And uh, we had a rehearsal before the concert. And of course, we're fooling around with the insides of the piano. And the lady in charge of the pianos, the lady in charge of the pianos in Russia always, the person in charge of the pianos in Russia always seems to be a lady. Um, <laughs> but in any case, she said, yeah, 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 yeah. You may not, you may not do that to our pianos. Um, and our pianist was Tony Baroni, yeah. uh, remember Tony, who actually could speak Russian. Uh, and he went into raving details about how beautiful the Glinka Hall was and that he cried every time he was in it. And oh, and, and finally the lady <laughs> rolled in and said, okay, you can use our pianos. Mm. But that was 97. That was, you know, much later than we had done this piece. It, it's crazy because, you know, I mean, they should understand no one wants to damage pianos. We just yeah. want to make beautiful sounds. We respect these, you know, everyone respects the instruments and I don't, I don't know, you know, the yeah. conversation really hasn't changed much. It doesn't damage the piano. No. Yeah, yeah. I've broken more strings playing Beethoven than contemporary music, so. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, it may be that some people don't know what they're doing when they go inside the piano. Uh, I mean, I don't, I understand them being careful and vigilant about it, but they also need to be reasonable that this is a legitimate I mean, they're not also, they're, there have not been many people who have followed George. It's very hard to follow George. I mean, he, he doesn't have people who are in his school. He is a one and only. And so this hasn't, you know, happened in an extensive way 
that people generally use the inside of the piano, not as extensively as George anyway. So well, some okay. people just some people just don't like modern music. And anything modern inside the piano, they're gonna come complain about. It's a prejudice that they have and they take it with them. You know, we felt we, you know, we felt that all the time. Well, just because we're talking about this this idea of extended techniques, I, I know Gil and, and Jim, you both mentioned that this was very challenging. Was this your first big uh, trial by fire in terms of using extended piano techniques or well, had there you were had other, some There were other pieces, I guess, that preceded this that uh, uh, I did your violin and piano pieces with Zukovsky, for example, yeah. which which is also very demanding. Uh -huh. And there's an earlier, at least uh, one or two earlier piano works that uh, I think uh, would use some of those same devices. How did you think of it, George? How did this come to you? Uh, well, it was it just seemed like an available uh, color possibility that would expand the uh, voice of the piano a bit. <laughs> And I experimented on my own sound. So did you experiment yourself with all of yes. these sounds? Uh, no. Uh -huh. You know, I couldn't play my own stuff very uh, convincingly, but I didn't have to play a whole score. You know, I could uh, try out certain possibilities. Uh, I admitted that I, I realized even when I was composing the pieces that some of this stuff is going to take special uh, there are special techniques, they would take extra rehearsal and so forth. And I, I had the idea, well, maybe once uh, these things became more common in music, that uh, pianists would uh, uh, learn that they were possible. You know, you guys made recordings, they hear the sound, <laughs> they know somebody does it, you know. So yeah. uh, that's what I hope for the, for the future that uh, the uh, the instrument might be enlarged for it, 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 this coloristic way. George, what I remember, and again, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, mm -hmm. Gil and, and Ray also, that when we first did the piece, we were only doing five movements of, a, of what we thought was a six movement piece, that there was a right. movement still to come. Of this, and, right. of this piece. I'd forgotten. And that. it was a scherzo. <laughs> um, is that right? Isn't that right, Ray? That's absolutely right. Yeah, um, and yeah, and yeah. that that you know we were just doing five six of what what the uh -huh. piece was going to be, and then you decided, uh -huh. uh, you decided no 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 that's the end of the piece. I think with Tracy, I think Tracy talked to it, Tracy uh -huh. uh, uh, into that. But it's hard now to imagine that there could have been a movement after after uh -huh. your after the final. Can anybody uh -huh. imagine that there could be a final movement? Uh, after the end of this piece, I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable to think about because yeah, that's such a uh, never too late, George. <laughs> don't do it, George. Totally don't do it as perfect as it is. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, I think one of my great days in, in playing with the Contemporary Chamber I mean, we did a concert in your hometown, George. Oh, oh uh -huh. you remember that? Was and it was like, okay. and it, I it just, it just, it seemed to tell me a lot about your music. I, I mean, the country style, the, the, I mean, you know, where, where we were, I think it was West Virginia. Carlson, West Virginia. Yeah, West Virginia. I don't remember the town. Is that a university anyway? Yeah. But it, the people there, it was a wonderful concert for you. Yeah. It was like in a small town, I think, on the high school, uh -huh. possibly. I don't know, but it was, it was really a sweet concert. Hmm. And it just kind of told me where you were coming from and yeah. how, how your music, it has such an influence on your, mu your music. You I have all these things in your head. Yeah. It's wonderful. It was because it was, a, it was a town of echoes. It was next to a river and uh, next to the river also oh, were mountains on the other side. So all the sounds in the town echoed. <laughs> and I think wonderful. Music has that That's echoing. interesting. That's really interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Your music is so filled with echoes it's of echoes. one sort or of another. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Mm. One thing I would have to say is that no one should attempt to do this piece without getting into the hall mm. at least two hours before to be comfortable. Right. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. I've heard yeah. performance of, uh, unfortunately, a Stony Brook group uh -huh. 
play at William Patterson once many many years after I did it, and uh, they didn't. It wouldn't go so well. Yeah. It just didn't go well. So after the performance, I asked them, you know, how'd you feel about it? And they felt oh, we were uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and they got there at the time of the concert, eight o'clock, mm-hmm. and they had not set up. They had no idea. I mean, for as far as the percussionists are concerned, and the pianist as well, I'm sure you have to be there for a while and get feel of where you where your instruments are at. You know mm-hmm. that, uh, mm-hmm. Will Russell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we, we we have to mark the instruments. That takes time. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was just a thing. I remember. I remember in Chicago when Shapey was trying to drive us off the stage. You remember that time? Right. He didn't give That's us time right. to reverse. Yes. Boy, boy. Well, that that was an unfortunate event. He was. Uh, yeah, it some, was. Somehow he was angry. I mean, he yeah. was angry a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I I loved him a lot, but he he took offense very easily. And I don't know why he was offended that we were doing this piece, but he was offended and he treated us very badly. I think I, so. I think he put the, the piece on uh, as the last piece on what was already an immensely long program. I, I remember we, we didn't even start playing until quarter 12 or something like that. Yeah. That was, wow. was insane. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I thought that was probably intentional on, on his part. Where was the first performance? Swartzman. I don't even remember. Was Swarthmore was the opening of that building? Of the opening of my music. Oh, okay, it was a Swarthmore, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know no, what else know. was on the program? I don't. You. I don't know whether you played in it. Uh, I think no. I think it was local Philadelphia players. Um, Paul Zukowski conducted a piece by uh, Harrison Burt Whistle, mm. uh, ah. and I can't remember the name of the piece, but it was a, it was a big piece for, I don't know. 16 players or something like wow. that. Um, um, that was the first part of the program. Yeah. Hey, George, before we get off, I just want to say something. I was mm-hmm. in the New York performance, you know, where they threw, where they did your 90th birthday mm-hmm. party. You remember that? I mean, it was, I was at that performance. It was mm-hmm. a wonderful performance. I mean, everybody played Fred Sherry's thing, organized it, I think. And you were down there. I said, my wife said, you should go tell George. Oh, sorry, we're- I said, I can't go see George now. He's no. surrounded by people. I, so I just apologize for not going down and congratulating you when I, I get a chance to do it now. <laughs> it was a wonderful concert for you. You well deserved, believe me. Yeah. Well, there, was a, there was a festival around his birthday that was really wonderful. That's right. A lot of works of his, yeah. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I think we're all proud of uh, is that this piece has probably been played hundreds of times, if not a thousand times, uh, because you know every university that has a percussion uh, area wants to play it. It's a great piece, and and it's great for them to play. And so it's a piece that lives. It keeps living. It's not like there was one performance then maybe randomly another couple of performances. It's done all the time. Mm-hmm. And there must be know, at least a thousand recordings of it. Right? Yeah. Right there. there are all sorts of recordings. Yeah. Do you have any idea why, why, why this piece? I mean, I love the piece, so it's like amazing. So I think that's why, but like, do you have any, you've played so many of his, of George's other pieces, Gil, and, and, like, is there reasons why this piece in particular? I mean, it's a big piece. You know, it's no small undertaking. Why, why this one? Well, because uh, the world of percussion has expanded so much over the past century. And uh, there are numerous really wonderful departments of percussion all over the world mm-hmm. and all over the country. And they want to play challenging pieces. And they want to play chamber music with other instruments. Mm-hmm. And they're also of course, piano departments in all of these places. So it's a very ambitious piece to do and very exciting for them to do. And that it will continue to be like that, I think. It's like, like the Bartok is done, you know, written in 38 yeah. and it's done and, you know, it's a classic. Mm-hmm. And so is this. I think, I think you also made a- that the, uh, um, the five movements of it are, are so different from each other. Each one is a masterwork on its own, of its own. And, and the last movement uh, is one of the most beautiful pieces that exists in all of music, I think. Uh, and 
and uh, people just want to play that and hear it. Yeah, I was just going to say there's a there's a lot of Gustav Mahler in that, yeah, there in is. that music. Some Bach I, too. I love his music, yeah. and I think some of it uh, that filters over into yeah. my thinking. <laughs> well, it's very hard for composers who are not great composers to incorporate other music in their music and to make it feel like it belongs and like it's meaningful and like it's has some emotional resonance. And uh, I mean, well, we all steal, but we hope that it doesn't, it's not so obvious. <laughs> right. It can sound hokey, like, <laughs> you know, but the, the way George incorporates it is, you know, classy and astonishing. Yeah. And, and when when the Bach comes up in the in the vibraphone, oh, I mean, yeah. my heart my heart is always pounding at that moment. You know, no other moment. No, all the other things. You know, it's <laughs> that passage right here. Oh, it's amazing. It's yeah, so and I'm poignant. just yeah. yeah, it's so intense. And Ray, I, I, I brought, uh, Steve Bruns asked me to bring a score. I see George has one. But I brought a score, which is the score that we used in 1974. Um, and, Do you, you want know, to show them the page? It, it looks totally different from what. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks old. For what do you mean it looks different? different. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I have it too. <laughs> but I wanted to I wanted to ask you on on the cover, I have written, of course, this is my copy. I have written um seventy third and Broadway. And I assume that's where we recorded it. Is that right? Seventy third so. and Broadway? Yeah. It was I don't a church. Know there. Yeah. yeah. The church. Yeah. The, the Rutgers church. church on seventy third and Broadway. Right. That's okay, right. that's it. All right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I, I'm still offended. George did not like the way I moaned. And oh, I forgot I was, I'm very. I was. I'm still insulted to this day. What? But you eventually got it because no, he did. did. Well, not in that. Not in the recording. Oh, you did. You did it in the recording. You did it, George. <laughs> oh. But, <laughs> but you shouldn't feel bad, Gil, because all four of us tried it, and George didn't like any of it. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Uh, George, I want to ask you, you know, um, whenever composers ask us about writing for extended technique, like, how should I write that? You want to hear, and we always, always say, just look at George Crumb's writing. I mean, you're, you're writing uh, for, you know, whenever indicating any extended techniques, it's just so clear and so beautifully done. Did you just know how to do it? Or like, how, how did that come about? D did you have models to follow or? Or maybe talking with performers, did that I, shape well, how you rotated things? Do, you know, myself, I play a little bit of piano, so that I could try the, try the sound, you see. But I never did it as well as the pianist who played the music, <laughs> but I could see the possibilities, you know. Well, that, that, that's absolutely true, uh, knowing about his notation. Everything is absolute. if you really read the instructions, it's so clear, so explicit what to do. And no, nobody else does that. I mean, every, you know, every single one of the extended techniques is described brilliantly. So that if you really pay attention, you can figure out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would just find it most efficient, clear, and beautifully done. And I, I, I wish everybody who writes for, you know, extended techniques, whether it's for piano or, or any, any instrument, would just like copy what you do. Then we wouldn't have to ask so many questions, you know? Well, do you guys in Yarn Wire, do you find that a lot of people are using the inside of the piano now? Absolutely. I would say that we sometimes have uh, co entire concert programs where Ning and I barely touch the keyboard. Uh -huh. at all. Really, really. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> and how is that for you guys? It's a shame to leave out the keyboard. Though. Well, <laughs> I feel that way too. So I, I like playing the piano. Yeah, sometimes I think we have even told composers, it would be nice to play some notes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> do, they, do they do it well? You play a lot of very young and not well-known composers. Do they write well for inside the piano? Some composers are, yeah, have, have really uh, developed their own sort of style of vocabulary and it works very well. And, you know, other composers, like you mentioned, are, are sort of trying out the idea. And so it's clear that it's a sort of evolutionary moment for them. Maybe they haven't quite arrived at the full realization of it yet, but yeah, it's, there are, are some techniques that we've been continue to be introduced to. We thought we knew all the strange things you could do to the inside of the piano, but we're always learning new things. Uh, have you two pianists played um, George's Zeitgeist uh, by any chance? Because when we were talking about damaging the strings, um, I remember that there's, there's a place in that where you're, you're supposed to rub a piece of violin rosin up and down the strings, uh, mm -hmm. and I always thought mm, that that might be a <laughs> that might be something that that is, the owners of the pianos might absolutely <laughs> object to if they really saw what we were doing because you know dust comes mm -hmm. off. Uh, oh, yeah. um, but yeah. we we have not played that piece, but we have added a lot of rosin in the various pianos. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You just bring a little rag and clean up the evidence and <laughs> try to clean up the evidence as much as you can. Yes. Yeah. I think George's music always has stood out. You know, we went through an era of music that was very complicated, you know, with the Warren and the Carter and the Babbitts and, you know, all 12 tone bootlegs, all, all of them. Very hard music to play. George came through with music. He had a voice that was just out there and it never changed. And I saw the, I, my personal, I, I'm not an authority on this stuff, but my personal opinion was the contemporary, the 2012 tone music began to dissipate because audiences weren't being, you couldn't get audiences for it. And it, composers began writing more commercial music, I thought. I really felt that way. I hope it's not still going in that trend, but it probably is. But George, he was, he had his voice and he never deviated. It was wonderful. I mean, to have a composer, you know. I, I just, I just always, I, I admired you, George. I really did because one of the reasons was that. Uh -huh. 
Are you still playing viola in the orchestra? Do you still oh, no, I never was a good, I never played much viola. George was playing viola in the orchestra. You just picked up on I, I just read about composers like Mozart and the, uh, Beethoven. I think he could play a little viola, but I, I, I wasn't that good. Either. Yeah, the I know. Viola, but still, you were doing but, it. But Ray, you're absolutely right, and it's so interesting. Uh, which of this music will live? I know you were a big Wernin fan, and uh, I mean it's an, just an interesting question. Even though George never changed his voice, every piece is different. Oh yeah, yeah. oh absolutely. Creative. You know, it's not like he's repeating oh, himself. God. It's just so, his voice spoken in so different crazy. ways. Every piece is incredibly original. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I heard what you did last year, Metamorphosis, and what my God, what a fantastic piece! Yeah. Oh, you know, yes. you, you oh, can and should take a look at it. It's it's even more complicated than other pieces. I mean, I heard Tony Baroni play it, who's a real master, and yeah. playing. Uh, I mean, all kinds of other instruments, percussion, and the logistics of that were really demanding and still what an original voice what a great piece yeah, oh, George, you yeah. never sent me the score i want the score no noteworthy uh, when we were doing all seven volumes of your american songbooks uh -huh. which we eventually recorded with bridge records and they're all on american folk songs of one or no, one way or another and yeah. they're there are 10 or 12 pieces in each in each book, but every book is so different from every other book. Uh, and it's not just because the texts are, are different. Uh, the music is totally different. Uh, and you have new ideas as we go from one book to another. Uh, and when we finally got to the seventh book, um, your vision had expanded in a way that was sort of wonderful, I thought. Have you played the, any of those books? Your group, no. Got it's a lot to do. It, it's an experience. It's a lot of percussion, yeah. yeah. It's an experience. It, it's a fantastic experience. I, I, I wonder if I could ask uh, one more question to, to George. Um, in your liner notes for the Nonesuch recording, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but you mentioned the critically important role of the performer in the evolution of any new music. It depends on the existence of a type of pioneer performer who in fact is engaged in creating and codifying the, and I'm gonna butcher this, codifying the Aufführungspraxis of our time, performance practice. Um, you go on to write that you enjoyed your collaboration with these four performers. Uh, and Richard uh, is not here. Um, could you speak about a little bit about your collaboration with Gil, Ray, James, and Richard, and what was so, you know, you talk about collaboration with performers in, in the liner notes quite a bit, and, and that really struck me as a performer. <laughs> well, I, I've always uh, known that uh, whatever I uh, bring into my music, I learned from performers. <laughs> you know, and I knew so many percussionists, for example, and that uh, fed my interest in uh, you know the, the beautiful instruments. I mean, the, the, the variety of uh, sound is is uh, beyond other instruments because there's so many. They all play so many instruments, and they do different things with those instruments. So composers learn from the percussionists. I've always felt a, a big, a great debt to to whoever plays an instrument. You know masterfully, then that, that somehow comes comes into your head, you know. You know, I, I remember about the early performances that we did in, in Chicago and, and Washington of the piece after Swarthmore, mm -hmm. uh, that I was always jealous of you, Ray, and, and, and Dick Fitz, because uh, the local percussionists would always come in and uh, show up at the hall and help you guys carry in the instruments. Uh, and it always seemed to me that there was a bond among percussion players that certainly didn't exist among pianists uh, or any other instrument that I knew of. But I, I think that is, I still think that is so that the percussionists really group together. Uh, and even the ones I've played with are always really nice guys and they like each other. Um, 
is there something there that I'm 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 missing about percussion players or or what? I mean, are there some bad guys who are percussion players? <laughs> I wouldn't even answer that question. <laughs> I wouldn't touch that with it. <laughs> that's funny. I think that's generally true, Jim. The way that's the way I always find it. Also, that yeah. that there's certain that that there is a community. Uh, even after concerts, if you go out, often the percussionists in town went out with the group. Uh, yeah. it, it is yeah. a close bond. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's all, I always, I, you could have been jealous of them, but I was not jealous of them. They had to stay after the concert, That's clean true. up the they stage, always, take everything did. out. I mean, yeah. pack it up. My You're God. Right. Well, sorry You're to right. leave you guys. I guess I we, know we go know. out. We we go out to supper, and they stay there working. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've there. experienced. You're absolutely I've ex- right. I've experienced uh, playing with a lot of orchestral con- percussionists, and and not not a good experience with that. Mm-hmm. You know, they would come into a rehearsal and they'd set up a triangle. You know, <laughs> and they, they should parties had twenty instruments. They should have twenty instruments around. They put up a triangle, and mm-hmm. then the conductor would say, "Well, you know, it was it was kind of hard." I mean, they, they, they weren't into the, their, their hearts weren't into new music, period. They were very trained to be orchestral players. I mean, really strictly orchestral players. And uh, they were different. They were different. Well, they isn't, were different. That, isn't that one of the big revolutions of the past hundred years? Is the, oh, absolutely. The role of percussionists, my God. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Even in jazz, the jazz is the same thing. Jazz drummers today do not sound like Jazz drummers from the 40s. I mean, that's there's a significant difference in the drumming all the way around, all over the world, you know. And George's has a lot to do with that. It has a lot to do with that. I mean, some of your madrigals that I've played, I mean, they were they were not easy to play. <laughs> you know, they were not easy to play, but they were challenging because they were they were, you know, they were different and they, very sensitive, just sensitive stuff. Speaking of the madrigals, Ray, you know, I, the first piece I ever knew of yours was the madrigals with the bass in it. Mm-hmm. And I was playing bass, and I thought, and I had really had to learn how to how to how to play the bass mm-hmm. and with those uh, in that particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was in the early '70s. And uh, as with percussion, bass double bass technique has expanded so much since then. Oh my gosh, what bass players can do and play now is mm-hmm. just incredible. Uh, oh yeah, bass players are the same, same are, thing as drums, yeah. Are amazing, absolutely amazing. And, oh yeah. And it all happened very quickly. And I, I think you may have had something to do with it actually. Um, well, we're, oh, yeah, all, we're all talking about how our instruments have been expanded, yeah. all of us. And you can say that for every instrument. That and and that George is really, in, you know, uh, uh, the important cog in all of that oh, yeah. by making those demands on players uh, yeah. of every instrument. I mean, even what what about for percussionists using four mallets to play at once? I mean, did that exist before? I mean, before the nineteen fifties. I have no idea, Gil. I was only born in nineteen fifty two. <laughs> you're a liar. You're a liar. <laughs> but certain techniques, there were certain techniques that we did have to learn. I mean, mm-hmm. playing a double mallet instrument, one in front of the other, glockenspiel and, and vibes. Well, you couldn't play vibes glockenspiel with a with a marimba, with a you know vibe mallet. You had us had four mm-hmm. different kinds of mallets. That's that's definitely true. Mm-hmm. You know, so there were techniques. I remember playing with the Philharmonic once. And uh, there was a six note chord on chimes. Mm-hmm. I won't mention any names. But <laughs> the guy looked at me and says, How do you, you, you can't do, do that? that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said, you, I said, You put your in there wherever you put them and you just do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it was always that. It was always that kind of thing. <laughs> there were the new music percussion players, and that's, they, they devoted their lives to it. They literally yeah. devoted their lives to it. Huh? You know? Well, you were one of them, Ray. Well, maybe I don't know. I, no I'm question. I'm not flattering myself, but well, you you don't you don't know how much your 
uh, revered in that world. Let's, let's, not, let's not talk about Ray. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let's talk about George. Uh, George I, is my I, inspiration. <laughs> George used to have a composition class at Penn, in which he'd invite me occasionally to come in and demonstrate <laughs> the bass. And I remember the first time I went in, I thought, well, you know, I'll have the solo from the Mahler first and Prokofiev's Lieutenant KJ, all, all the big bass solos ready. George had, yeah. had, didn't want to hear those at all. He yeah. wanted to hear what happens if you hit the bass with the, your elbow or your yeah. thumb or rub yeah. your thumb this way and that. And one time I had, my wife had given me for a birthday present, a collapsible bass stool. Remember that, George? <laughs> uh, and it was really easy to carry around because you drag it up into two pieces and carry it with one hand. And I was using that for the first time in George's class. And all of a sudden, the collapsible bass stool collapsed. <laughs> and George always said he remembered that as the funniest thing that ever happened in, his, in all his class teaching. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's OK, if I, I would love to ask one sort of final question before we wrap up today. Um, and that is after George's piece, uh, did the four of you, uh, and again, I know that Dick isn't here with us today, did the four of you play any other works together? Were there any other big works for two piano and percussion that you took on as a group? Well, I, I was, I had some kind of a residency in Swarthmore and Jim and I played many two piano concerts, but- Gil not. was very gracious and invited me. It was Paul, Gil and Paul series. And Gil was so kind as to invite me sometimes to play two piano or forehand stuff with him. And, and I suppose that was what, that was why I, I was the, the second pianist in, in music for a summer evening because of, because it was at Swarthmore and because Gil and I had played together. But yeah, I don't well, think we did. Maybe we did in the Library of Congress. Did we do a Roger Reynolds piece? At yeah. that at that concert, we did. At yes. that time. Yeah. Less, less than we two? Talked, is that the one? That. Yes, yeah, that's we talked it. about getting yeah. the Library of Congress to commission a piece every year. If the library would do it, they turned us down. Mm. I don't know who you, you might have talked to them, Gil. Not me, I know that. Mm. But we, we thought this would be a good idea to have composers write for that medium. But they, they turned us down. Never, well, never there, there are many pieces, of course, for that now. No, there, there are. Now, now, yeah. Tremendous. I still think the idea would have been a good idea. It was a good know. idea, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we up. think it's a great idea. <laughs> we, we didn't have an executive director in the group, so that's uh, writing for grants all over the place, and that's why that didn't happen, I think. <laughs> no, yeah, well, it's possible. Anyway. Well, thank you all of you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, and you know, it, it's been so lovely, Gil and Ray, to see you again after so many years. And although Gil has been so long since I saw you, but feels like a long time no matter what these days. Um, and George and Jim, so nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and I just want to say also thank you to everyone who has watched our series this year. Um, it's been a really wonderful way to celebrate our 15th anniversary season uh, in lieu of concerts and performances. And to follow what's coming next for Yarn Wire, you can subscribe to our channel for new videos or music that we'd like to share with you in the coming months and years. Uh, and you can also always check out our website at www.yarnwire.org. Thanks so much for watching.